Today's podcast message uh, is called The Temple and the Messiah. And today I'm going to talk about the details and the history of the destruction of the second temple and how that proves Yeshua is the Messiah. This is a topic that that we usually, if, if it gets brought up at all, it's kind of skimmed over. It's, oh yeah, the temple came down in AD 70 and then we move on. I, I was moved to look into the details of this uh, a couple years ago and it is very intriguing. So today's today's message is pretty long and I would like to let you know ahead of time that if you listen at the end of this, you're going to understand first century Judaism and what actually happened in AD 70 and understand our faith quite a bit more than you did at the beginning because it's it's very intriguing and I, I don't know why some of us get moved to get so deep into certain topics and not others. Uh, but this one, this is one where I, I spent some time uh, to, because I had a question. The question that I asked was, why do the Jewish people think the second temple came down? Because if you're a Christian or Messianic or whatever we're called these days, you, you have a good idea why. And it's important. It's important because our perspective because is is one our meaning the messianic believers or the Hebrew roots or Jewish roots or whatever you whatever we want to be called today we live in this in this plane of existence uh, between you know the book the page, the page of the Bible between Malachi and Matthew we we are definitely Genesis to Revelation believers we're the remnant people we keep the commandments of Yahweh and the testimony of Yeshua we're different um, but we're not terribly different and we do a lot of stuff from the Old Testament we don't mind uh, you know being informed uh, by rabbinical resources just like we don't mind being informed by historical documents which is what I'm going to be using today pretty much and we really need to understand what happened before in as much detail as we can because that's going to inform what's coming because because if you don't know if you're new to this this way is that the, the the faith of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and Yeshua and Paul and Peter and everybody Yeshua being the the Son of God right the Messiah that faith is an is more of an Eastern faith than a Western faith. A Western faith is is Western belief systems are kind of a straight line, and and everything builds towards a climax, which is happening, but it happens in cycles in the Torah in in the Tanakh. Tanakh meaning the Old Testament. Everything happens in in kind of a you know the the end of a story is the beginning of another story, which is similar to the last story. These cycles we see play out uh, through Scripture. And then when the New Testament comes along and Christianity becomes basically Gentileified, they threw away the old history. They threw everything else away and decided that a new religion was started basically in Acts 15 and and that everything else before is just kind of for reference only. Well, that, that's not even remotely true. It's nothing what the first century believers did. So one of the biggest proofs we have that, that Yeshua is the Messiah is a topic that's very l not tread on too much, and today we're going to get into that. And, and so understand that when there's a war and history in general is, is something that's recorded by, by one of two parties, the victors or the survivors. So, so it's not possible to know with all details and certainty about things when we talk about ancient history, particularly when it surrounds war, because because the recordings are going to be biased in one direction or the other. If we think about modern history, this is the similar topic because I, I, I don't know, people are probably still old enough to remember the Cold War with, with Ronald Reagan and, and Mar Margaret Thatcher uh, launched a policy of peace through strength and to defeat the Soviet Union by basically outspending them on military uh, hardware, military equipment. We just decided that we were going to to just build this this enormous 
military might that the USSR couldn't keep up with because they were a very militaristic dictatorship, communism and socialism and all. And so, so Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and got together with the rest of the free people, NATO and everybody, and we built these enormous, enormous militaries that we didn't necessarily need, and nuclear arms and such. And the Russians, because they couldn't, they had a closed economy, they could not keep up and they tried. And that bankrupted the Soviet Union. It was, it was how Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher defeated the Soviet Union without firing a shot. And the Berlin Wall came down in 1991, 1990, 1991, with George Herbert Walker Bush, the president, who was the vice president under Ronald Reagan. That was all a plan that modern history is never going to tell you because modern history historians don't like Ronald Reagan and they don't like Margaret Thatcher, and they never they never bring it up. So when we talk about history, we we understand that it's very very biased. Uh, before I, I get back into the temple stuff, I do talk about what we just went through with COVID nineteen from basically February of two thousand twenty until the present day. The entire world has been in this incredibly chaotic situation where. Uh, we, we shut down economies and put on masks and did all sorts of, of now ridiculous looking things. And, and will our kids even believe it? Well, they even understand. We say, oh, yeah, we shut down the economy in 2020, right? I bet President Trump shut down the world's economy because of COVID-19. Well, what I did was I, I saved a bunch of printed newspapers from this time period and, and I'm going to preserve them as long as I can so that my grandchildren don't think that I'm lying to them when I tell them about what happened in the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is because I know, I know as I'm talking today, that history is never recorded accurately. And and very, now I don't want to say never, because you usually get about 80% of the truth or or 70 percent of the truth and sometimes we get all of the truth it's just overlooked but i i guess the way the best way to put it is is that in in popular conversation right now people think that sarah palin said she could see russia from her house she never actually said that it was a comedian so that's what i'm trying to get at is that is that in our society history is more of a pop culture experience uh, than it is of actually knowing history so we have a source of information, a very good source of information about the time period around the destruction of the Second Temple. And those are the works of Flavius Josephus, who was a Levite and a Jew. Not, he's Israelite, but he's Jewish because in that, in that day and time, the word Jew meant all of them, like it means today. And he was a Pharisee and I will reference Josephus casually today because I've read uh, his works cover to cover, and he was basically um, uh, a guy who uh, was it was a Levite who was in charge of cities, as you remember from the Torah. You have you have Levites in the towns, and he was he was he had oversight over s uh, some towns in Judea, and he spent a lot of his time before the invasion trying to stop the people from revolting against Rome because he was also a Roman citizen. He was recognized by the Roman government and he was in the Levitical priesthood. So he was kind of walking both sides of the fence. And after the temple came down, he, he was, uh, he became a collaborator and he, you know, was on the Roman side. He lived, I think he died natural causes, but he was allowed by the, the Roman emperor to record the history of the Jewish people. Because as we're going to see here, the Roman emperor wanted to erase the Jewish people. And he allowed Josephus to write a history of the Jewish people because he, I'm sure the Roman emperor thought that that was all that was going to survive when he was done. So, Josephus is a very good uh, reference, and, and it's very, very you know, important works, 
But we also have to understand from what I was just talking about that his works are going to be written in a perspective of saving his own skin. He wasn't going to write too critically of the Romans uh, because, you know, he was a collaborator and he he had to, to walk that line for the rest of his lives, his life. So in this vein, we just need to remember that we, we work in working doctrine off of history, that history is written from perspectives and, and very seldom is it purely objectively recorded. But history is very important to use to understand one of the biggest proofs that Yeshua is the Messiah. The proof is the destruction of the temple, and, and I will be explaining that in due time. So the big divide here between us and Judaism is that from a Jewish historical perspective, the general blame for the fall of the second temple in 70 AD is recorded as a disunity among the Jewish people that caused Rome to invade. The picture we paint of first century Judea lacks a lot of details. Even today's Jews have to use the New Testament heavily to understand what was happening in that day and time. Today, today's the, the vast written account of life in AD 30 to AD you know, 40, 50, 60 is the New Testament. We have the Gospels, and we know that Revelation is a very, very Jewish-oriented book, and Paul's letters. Um, these, these are these are the most authoritative things. Even if you don't believe in them, they're the most authoritative things. Until we get to Josephus, who was written after A.D. 70, and um, and then nonetheless, we we need to use history, Josephus, and and other sources which will be referenced at the end of this, to understand what was happening when the invasion occurred. Okay, So there, there were four factions. This is from Jewish historical uh, uh, sources. And that There were four factions in first century Jerusalem. There were the Pharisees. These We know who the Pharisees are. We read the New Testament. We know how the Pharisees and Sadducees believed um, because of their interactions with Yeshua. Pardon me for taking a drink, but this one's going to be a long one. Um, the Pharisees were very legalistic. They liked their traditions. They liked their purity. But they also lived in the synagogues or lived. They resided in the synagogue system. So the Pharisaical system was, was very much like a denomination of Christianity, uh, back in the 80s, right? If you think about when we had big, powerful denominations that had churches everywhere that taught generally the same thing, believed generally the same stuff, had the same order of services, the, where we get our um, our church services from is from the synagogue, and that's the Pharisees. They're, but they were legalistic, they liked traditions, and they liked purity. Then you have the Sadducees. These are the people who rejected the oral law. They even rejected the uh, anything after the Torah as being inspired. And the uh, his Jewish references say that these are the guys who wanted to compromise with Rome. And that doesn't make sense. And I'll get to that in a minute. But then we have these other two, uh, these other two groups, the Zealots. They were passionate nationalists like the Maccabees. They were violent against the Romans. And this is the kind of the group that was making the Romans have to retaliate. The zealots were people who were um, very zealous for the Torah, and they and they wanted those Romans out. And these are kind of probably the people who said, Yeshua, is it time for you to make your kingdom? Or asking him if he's going to throw the Romans out. That's probably these guys. Uh, all even though all of them wanted the Romans out, the zealots were were most like that. And then there's this other group of, called the Sicarii, who were Jewish terrorists and assassins who would kill their own countrymen if they compromised. And these guys are the the kind of the bad actors who would, um, you know, stir up, uh, you know, revolts and stuff like that. And if you watch the uh, the series called The Chosen, uh, they made one of the apostles out to be one of these guys, and they did a pretty nifty job of it. Uh, the Chosen, uh, first two seasons, 
I've watched and they seem pretty good. And, and we all know at some point they're going to make a hard left turn and <laughs> turn turn the apostles into uh, Southern Baptists. At some point they will, but um, but the first two seasons are pretty good. So when I talked about the Sadducees and, and how, you know, they they were the ones who wanted to compromise, and I'm putting that in air quotes, air quotes is, is is the fact that we know two guys who compromised with Rome, and that's Flavius Josephus, it's Josephus, and another guy called Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. They were both Pharisees, and the Pharisees are the ones who who existed. The the destruction of the temple and destruction of Judea. I keep teasing this, but I'm going to get there, and and today is more like a talk show than a message, I suppose. But the uh, we're going to get there at some point, I swear, right? Uh, but but the guys, Pharisee Judaism is what survived. The Sadducees were wiped out. Yochanan ben Zakkai was smuggled out of Jerusalem to meet with Titus and make a compromise that allowed the Jewish faith to continue to exist. This Pharisee literally struck a deal with Rome to move the Sanhedrin out of Ju Jerusalem, out of Judea, and preserved it. And, and, and this is all in Yahweh's plan, mind you. Just keep in mind that Yahweh wanted this to happen. None, this is all bad stuff, and Yahweh uses bad stuff to bring about his, his, uh, you know, his desires. But Yahweh wanted the faith to leave Judea. He wanted it to go to the nations and... The apostles used the synagogue system as their starting point. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was the guy who struck the deal with the Romans to allow Judaism to continue to exist inside the Roman Empire. The, the Pharisees held the synagogues, and so they were the ones who had the alternative to, to the temple. The Sadducees... The Zealots and Sicarii were all temple, 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 temple. The Pharisees, the, the, the synagogue system that came up after Nehemiah and Ezra rebuilt uh, Jerusalem, the Pharise that, that, that synagogue system is what uh, continued to exist. So it makes a lot more sense for the Pharisees to be the compromisers since their adherents would already have been compromising. Just keep in mind the Septuagint, the Greek uh, Old Testament, was written 100, 150 years before Yeshua, 150 BC, and um, that's in Greek, and that was in the synagogue, which is a Greek word. So the Pharisees were already living in Rome. Paul the Apostle was a Roman citizen, Flavius Josephus is a Roman citizen, both Jews, both faithful Jews, Paul being Messianic, and so you know, the Pharisees are really the ones who uh, were the compromisers. But this is a case where history is biased. The Pharisees are the care, uh, are the, the compromisers. They just don't want to be called that, I suppose. So Josephus is actually regarded as a traitor to modern Jews, but he was also a Pharisee and produced the most historical evidence we have about that time. Before the final uprising, he spent his time, you guessed it, getting Jews to compromise with Rome. And when the final uprising came, he, he did serve Rome and was their ambassador. So, so we have to ask, if the Sadducees were the compromisers, why did they get wiped out? So different factions and a lack of respect for leadership or a lack, for, lack of leadership at all that was principled enough surely contributed to the demise of Judea. That chaos, that anarchy, that lack of standards is a component to the destruction of, of, of the land. They were in a state of confusion. The compromisers thought that they were trying to preserve the nation and the faith. Purists and loyalists, uh, purists loathed compromisers, constant bickering, even violence among the holy people. This should sound familiar. And one of the reasons to study history is so that we don't repeat it. Because if you look around today, we have an incredible amount of infighting inside of our own country that resembles this. It's very familiar. And the other reason, a big reason to study history is so we don't repeat it. 
the level of disunity in Judea was so bad that the Jews were actually killing each other while Rome was invading. And Rome already had a footprint, but they were bringing in their big muscle and they were taking out the towns and cutting off roads and cutting off supply lines. And even that common enemy couldn't get the, excuse me, the Jewish people to actually coalesce and, and, and come up with a singular way of fighting. And, and of course, the zealots, um, the zealots probably thought that they were going to um, have a miracle and that Yahweh was going to deliver them. And you, you really can't blame them, you know, except that they didn't recognize the Messiah. So if they had recognized the Messiah, then they would have known. So another thing that's interesting here is, is as you look, they had, there's four factions in first century Judaism. And, and, and look at what's missing, right? They didn't record us. It omits the Messianics. It, it omits the people who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. And there were plenty of us by 65 AD. Think about the book of Acts talks about what 8,000 people baptized in two different uh, instances. This faith of ours, a continuation of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this, this was exploding in AD 30, AD 35, AD 40. It's, it's very large, and they don't record it. Why is that? I don't think we need to, to explain why that is. Now, Josephus actually does record the followers of Yeshua, and he mentions Yeshua himself briefly in a very flattering terms. But we're not included in the modern accounts of the destruction of the temple, and we all know why. Because the Messianic believers remembered that Yeshua said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, head for the hills. Now, this is another point of doctrine that we need to really focus in on, because most of Christianity today doesn't believe that happened before. And that has happened twice before, when the Greeks invaded and, and tried to overtake the temple, which they did, and then they were pushed out. That was a couple hundred years before you know Yeshua. And then when the Romans encircled, Matthew 24, Yeshua was talking to them about something that was going to happen in their lifetimes. When he said, when you see the city surrounded, you must leave and you don't turn back and you, and you don't go. Uh, if you're on the house stuff, you just go, just go. And what happened in AD 70 is that the Roman army stopped inexplicably. They stopped for a couple hours before they invaded the city, and that allowed the Messianics to escape. The other four groups didn't believe Yeshua was the Messiah, and they lost their lives. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Because it's very important to understand that that's foreshadowing the end of days and actually losing eternity. Those who don't accept Yeshua as the Messiah before that very end are going to be lost to eternity, just like these guys who refused to accept him and decided that they were going to fight to keep the temple, and they lost. So, the events that caused the destruction of the temple and the second, the present exile took about 120 years to play out. And this is this is another very I don't know important is the word for it, but but it really helps you to understand that when we talk about the Bible, we talk about extended periods of time. We we don't in our Western society today, where we get out of out of out of sorts, if the clock in our car isn't exactly the same as the as our wrist watches, our phone watches, our other watches, right? We have this level of precision, this level of now, that just didn't exist in biblical times. It didn't have to be perfect in order to be true. Today we have this this sense that it has to be perfect to be true. But in 63 BC, 63 years before the Messiah. 
Pompey's troops entered Jerusalem to put down infighting at the invitation of Jewish leadership. And he never left, because that's the way Rome was. Go ahead and invite them in, because they're never going home. And uh, they kind of brought it on themselves. And one could argue it even started before this when the Maccabees made a treaty with Rome when Rome wasn't humongous. But the point here is we can't measure the time Yahweh measures time. In the past 150 years, I'm talking from 2022 back, 150 years, there have been prophecy systems and ways of thinking that come up out of, you know, this 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 Christian, you know, this Christian system that's it's completely ignorant of the Old Testament, but thinking, uh, co concocting scenarios that the end of Western civilization is the end of the world and making, compressing everything in time in order to, to try to say that, you know, certain events have, have been, you know, have said this is the end of days. And they've all been wrong because prophecy often takes a really long time to play out. Remember that when the Hebrews were grown up in Egypt, 70 people go in, 2 million come out. How long? How long did that take? 150, 200, 400 years? The Bible says hundreds of years, right? I think it says different in two different places. It takes a long time for these things to play out. Um, the plan of salvation is a 7,000 year plan. It's not a six-day campaign. The Hebrews were grown up in Egypt over hundreds of years. The plan of salvation is going to take 7,000 years. So the message for today is also to say, you know, look at things as, as more of a broad over time type thing rather than all these, these pointed, we get all uptight because we see you know, Russia invades Ukraine. Oh, is that the people from the north? Maybe. Or maybe it's just Russia invading Ukraine, you know? So, let's look at some scriptures now. Daniel 9, 25 and 26. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with the flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Now, as I said, some people study some topics, some people study others. I'm not one to know how to count out this formula. But the decree to rebuild the temple came from Cyrus of Babylon in 536 B.C., 536 years before Yeshua, the culmination of the prophecy on the board lands squarely during Yeshua's ministry. Some people have counted this off to be precise down to the day of his execution. But there's no doubt that this time culminated in Yeshua's day because of the record of the New Testament, which is why I don't feel the need to take the time to, to learn the counting, because King Herod knew, and the wise men knew, and everybody knew it was time for the Messiah when Yeshua came on the scene. That's why they had all those false Christs at the same time, and all those other uprisings. They knew it was time. And so we have to understand that the amount of time the Hebrews were in Egypt, and the amount of time that the events that transpired between the decree to rebuild the temple and Yeshua's execution, these are incredibly long periods of time and where Yahweh's will is, is done perfectly. And oftentimes the people who are participants don't even realize it. You, you, you understand the first century you know, believers, the, the apostles, they were part of that execution of Yeshua. They, they watched it. They weren't part of it, but they, they watched it play out. And it was later that Yeshua had to explain to them that they were fulfilling prophecy. They were part of it and didn't realize. So back to first century Jerusalem, Herod had built a fortress to guard the temple. and It took a long while for the Romans to get that far into the city. Tens of thousands of Roman soldiers were battling tens of thousands of Jews, and the carnage was immense. The suffering was hell. When the Jews tried to escape the city, 
they were crucified facing the temple. It was terrible. There was no food. You know there's a prophecy that people, that women were going to eat their own kids. That's when this happened. That That's not, that might be a future event, but it absolutely happened at the siege of Jerusalem when the women ate their own children. So when Jews were famished by starvation, managed to escape, they were crucified facing the city while starving in the sight of those inside of Jerusalem who were also starving. Uh, by the way, one of those factions, it was either the Sakari or the Zealots, actually burnt up all of the spare food that Jerusalem had stored up in case Rome attacked. They burnt it up because they wanted to bring the fight. Isn't that stupid? Because they might have won had they not done that. No, nah, they wouldn't have won because Yahweh wanted the temple to come down. But then... When, when the fighting started, when Jerusalem was surrounded and they were moving their way towards the temple, the only choice was which horrific death you were going to endure. Either starving or crucifixion while starving or dying in battle with the Romans. From either perspective, you had to watch your country's demise while being helpless to do anything about it. So the Romans laid siege works against Herod's fortress, but the Jews craftily set up a trap that burnt the siege works to the ground. It was a, quite a victory. And after Titus starved the city, uh, he had all the trees cut down within a 13-mile perimeter and built another rampart. Now keep in mind, this is... First century A.D., there are no power straws, there are no semi-trucks. Oh no, this was all done by hand. So the Jews got to watch this while they were starving and couldn't do anything about it. Except for the Jews who they used as slaves to cut down all those trees and rebuild the siege works that would end their nation. We need to understand the evilness of the Roman Empire. And, and we have it today. That the Chinese and the Russians are are equally as as brutal. They're only with they're only held back because they think they might get beat by us, and and that's it. But this this level of war that destroyed Judea um, was was so bad that um, I don't think we can appreciate it today. So if the Jews who were inside the city wanted to stop the rampart from being built, they had to shoot their own countrymen with arrows. They had to kill their own people to stop the second rampart. When the fortress finally fell, the last of the fighters retreated into the temple. A Roman soldier set the temple on fire. Many Jews threw themselves into the fire to try to die nobly, or at least not at the hands of the Romans. Many Roman soldiers entered the melee and died as well. It was horrific to the extreme. Romans and Jews dying together as the temple burnt with human blood running down the steps of the temple, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Yeshua and also a punishment on both peoples for the innocent murder of the Messiah. So when we talk about the temple falling in 70 AD, it's almost always just said, oh yeah, the temple came down in 70 AD, as as if, as if even even by our own modern standards that it, it you know of warfare that it came down overnight, you know like like in uh, Gulf War One when we pushed the Iraqis out of Kuwait, that's not what we're talking about with the destruction of the temple, and um, it's just it's just not. You look at the timing, the slide that's on the screen right now. You were, it says desolations are determined. It's just a, a couple of words. But it's talking about the end coming with the flood. Even to the end there will be war. And we read this and we think it's the end time war, which it may be as well. 
But the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of all of Judea, was prophesied by Daniel the prophet and even by Yeshua. And he knew his death on the cross was going to result in this destruction. All these people... They didn't have rifles, they didn't have bombs, they had swords, they had bows, they had staffs. They all died in close quarter combat. The screams, the agony, the death was immense. It was it was huge, and hell doesn't even describe it. People who tried to surrender were executed. The elderly were summarily executed. Tens of thousands were sold as slaves. Any warriors not killed or crucified were taken to Rome to die in arenas fighting wild animals. And guess what? They had to carry the temple treasures to Rome as slaves on their way. The Romans were not nice people. The Romans did not want to sack Jerusalem because they knew the cost. They knew it would take a very long period of time to actually crush the Jewish people. But when they brought it down, they took the stones of the temple back to Rome. They took the treasures back to Rome and they turned it into something else. They put up with it so long because they knew it was going to be that difficult to crush the Jewish people. And when it finally fell, they made sure the world knew by making a horrific example of the Jews. But again, Yahweh knew this well in advance, so he set the situation for it to happen. Now for the perspective. Titus began the siege of Jerusalem in 66 AD, and it did not fall until 70, at the cost of more than a million lives. The actual siege of the entire region of Judea started earlier and ended later to turn that land into a complete desolation. You understand they erased the trees. They erased the vegetation. It was a different landscape before that war. They destroyed the earth and they didn't do it with tanks and with flamethrowers. They did it hand-to-hand -hand combat and with slave labor and they destroyed everything. After the fall of the temple, Titus raised R A Z E D the rest of Jerusalem and committed suicide, genocide to attempt a complete eradication of the Jewish people. So Amos 3, 6, and 7 says, If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not Yahweh done it? Surely Adonai Yahweh does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servant the prophets. So the reason I told this graphic long story is to show that it only makes sense if you're messianic or Christian for modern parlance. The only scriptures in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, that hint about the second temple coming down also include the Messiah coming at the same time. The Messiah coming and the temple coming down are are hand in hand. All the Jewish sources I have read have reasons, but no scripture at all as to the timing of the second destruction of Jerusalem. And the reason for my history lesson today is to answer these people who say that, that, that today that they're rejecting Yeshua as the Messiah. Well, that's one of the reasons, right? Because that is happening in our movement. That people are, are getting into this and they're coming to the grips, they're, they're coming to these silly points of saying that Yeshua is not the Messiah. Well, Yeshua is the Messiah, and, and you understand if he's not the Messiah, then there's no reason or explanation for the last 2,000 years. There's no prophesy, prophecy in the Old Testament about the temple coming down and, the, and that is not tied to this Yeshua being the Messiah. Our movement is so concerned about details and straining at gnats that we've forgotten the truth is, is pretty easy to know. The pile of rocks in Jerusalem with the Muslim mosque on top of it proves that Yeshua is the Messiah. 
In Luke 19, 41 through 44, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children with you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Yahweh doesn't do these big things without first telling us through his prophets. The destruction of the first temple was prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah, so the prophecy of the destruction of the second temple was given by one greater than those prophets. Yeshua wept over this news. It hurt him. He knew he was about to be crucified and die a horrific death, and he knew he was about to be rejected by his own people. He knew it all, and yet he was sorry and sad. He knew that Jerusalem, Jerusalem was going to be laid to waste, and he told his followers in advance so they would know when to leave and Christianity would spread. Daniel 9.27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. A complete destruction. People, we read this today, most of Christianity reads this today as a future prophecy, forgetting that it already happened once. We focus on the temple, but the entire region was laid waste. Jerusalem had all its trees cut down while the people watched. And then the Jewish slaves had to actually build the siege ramps and ramparts out of their own trees so their enemies could kill their countrymen complete humiliation and subjugation that took years to complete this is why josephus didn't want to make it ha let it happen this is why the romans didn't want to do it they didn't want to go through this the lesson learned there is that yeshua knows how it's going to be at the end so does yahweh they know what it's going to take to get rid of the evil and to, to really sift out the chaff and they're going to do it. It's prophesied. A worldwide destruction is coming. And the only way for us to have any hope of making it through that is to accept, accept Yeshua as the Messiah. The second temple came down after the Messiah was crucified and resurrected. And there was enough time to start the fire that is Christianity. And we have to be like we are now. We have to be like we are now until there's a complete destruction. You understand that most of the time the second temple stood, the Jews were under foreign rule. Or maybe half the time. The Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. Today Jerusalem is under U.S. rule. This presents a new dilemma. It's a new dilemma. But the people who are willing to compromise with the nations are the descendants of the Pharisees. Jews fight today under the constraints of modern political whims, and they use our weapons. They go out of their way to not kill civilians, to have measured responses to incursions, and they put up with a whole lot of nonsense in order to stay in our good graces. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that something that our country, which is where Christianity was allowed to flourish and spread across the entire known world. We produce almost all of the world's Bibles. We are also playing the part of the Romans in the first century and controlling Israel. So, I do not want you to be, you brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then uh, that's Romans 11.25, and then Zechariah 8.22-23. through 23. 
So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek Yahweh of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, in those days ten men from all the nations will grab, grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So we got to understand that these things take a really long time to play out. Are we at the time of the fullness of the Gentiles? I don't think so. Are we at the time where people of the nations are looking fondly on Jewish people? I don't think so. How do we get to the fullness of the Gentiles? Well, brothers and sisters, that's the reason for the last 2,000 years. It's all new covenant stuff. It's all new covenant. It's all about bringing all the mankind the opportunity of salvation before Yeshua returns and we usher in the millennial era. era. This is all a humongous, humongous plan that's being allowed to play out over thousands of years. And the gospel had to go forth to the nations. And Jerusalem had to come down for that to happen. Hebrews 13, 14. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. So many Christians support Israel today because their theology and their selfishness. Believing a third temple made with hands is a sign of the end days as it needs to be defiled again and a benchmark for the return of, the Yeshua, of Yeshua. They believe that the temple has to be defiled one more time in order for the Jews to, to accept Yeshua. Yeah, well, guys, if the destruction of temple number two didn't do that, right after he ascended, I don't think us repeating it is going to get it done. And rooting for a temple to get built just for the sake of its defilement one more time, and for another brutal genocide, I, it just does, doesn't seem to wash with me. It doesn't seem like Yahweh would allow them to return, you build another temple and fail one more time. And when Christianity gets into that mode of building another temple, what we are actually doing is adopting the prophecies of Judaism. Judaism still wants to have an earthly kingdom with an earthly king. They want to restore the temple of Solomon. They want to restore that Jerusalem, that Judea, that Israel. What do we want? What is it we're looking for? What is it that the author of Hebrews is looking for? We are looking for the new Jerusalem that was not made with hands, to come down from Shemayim, from heaven, and for all mankind to go worship there. That's what I'm looking for. There's no verse in the Old Testament that supports the construction and destruction of a third temple. There's the Ezekiel temple. But as we dig deeper and deeper into Torah and Bible study, over time we forget the big picture. And today I wanted to show the big picture and the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and how that ties into our present situation. And all of it points to the most important truth a person can know, that Yeshua is the Messiah. The, destru <coughs> the destruction of the second temple is permanently and inextricable strictly connected to Yeshua being the Messiah through the prophet Daniel. And Yahweh only does stuff through the, when he tells us through his prophets. So only Yeshua prophesied the destruction of the second temple. All of the other false messiahs said, oh no, we're going to throw Rome out. We're going to be like the Maccabees. We're going to push them out. Only Yeshua said it was coming down. They even brought that up at his trial. And so there's no prophecy concerning the destruction of a third temple and repeating this cycle again. Something else is coming. Something larger is coming. The death and destruction is going to be more worldwide than isolated in Jerusalem. And you always got a plan. 
And he's told us, and his son has told us, what to do to inherit everlasting life. It's to accept Yeshua as the Messiah, to repent of our sins, to be baptized, and then adopt the commandments and live the best you can walking them out. And thank you so much for putting the time in to listen to this one. Um, please drop by firstcenturychristianity.net. Uh, please like and share this message wherever you're seeing it. And may Yahweh bless you and keep you in the name of his son, Yeshua.